Okay, so we're talking about maintaining performance and reliability at the edge of this global delivery network that we operate. What I really want to do is just share a few observations about tools and culture, getting them to support each other and support this network. Um, of course, this is a popular topic lately. Uh, there's a talk uh, later this afternoon called Tools Shaping Culture. Uh, most of us probably remember back uh, to 2009, uh, John Ospa and Paul Hammond's talk from that year, uh, where they talked about lowering risk of change through tools and culture, and talked about how that helped promote teamwork uh, between dev and ops. Uh, what you might not know is that uh, Velocity has been running a lot longer than we all think. Um, and the funny thing is, we've been talking about the same stuff pretty much all along. <laughs> this is from the way, way back machine. Um, and this interplay between tools and culture is sort of the story of humanity, I think, right? Like, I now understand why uh, it, we tend to be so slow at producing documentation sometimes. I think it just runs in the genes. Um, you think back to like two and a half million years ago, some engineers uh, get together and they produce the, stone, the first stone pickaxe, right? And it's great, it's awesome. The next day, QA files a bug report and says, where's the documentation? So they were agile, goes in the backlog, sits there for a few hundred thousand sprints. Finally, 10,000 years ago, they're sick of the nagging and the engineers come back and they're like, okay, fine, we invented writing and the alphabet. Hopefully this will meet your documentation needs, like now and forever. <laughs> so um, back to the present, um, there we are. What do we want to do with tools and culture? We want to help our businesses deliver on the promises that we make to our customers. Uh, for us, that means things like delivering performance at the edge, being secure by design, um, offering a globally scalable network. For engineering teams, this boils down to things like be fast, secure, reliable, functional, responsive. And so those are big, broad objectives. How do we actually make progress in those areas? Well, let's take an example. If you want to be reliable, there are many things you could do that might help. You could hire more QA people. You could write more automated tests. You could build tools for performance analysis or for release management. And the right choices among those are going to depend on your organization. So let's look at your organization. And we can use Conway's law, which tells us that your software architecture and design will end up being a mirror of your organizational structure. And this influence of organization on technology has both static elements and dynamic elements. And sort of regardless, regardless of what the details of those are, they all carry a lot of inertia. So when it comes time to do something new, uh, you have a choice to make. Uh, and this is really the key point that I want to make. You can either ask, what org do we need to build some software, X, Y, Z? Or you can ask, uh, given the org that we have, what software can we efficiently produce to address a particular business problem? And that might allow you to go with the inertia. And so in order to do that, you need to look at your available options, like we saw in the Be Reliable example, and find the one that fits well for your organization. Um, so I just want to show one example from our environment Then it has been a nice case where we've found a tool that really sits at a nice sweet spot uh, within our technology and within our organization. This is a system that we call Coal Mine because we use it to manage uh, releases of code and configuration changes that we call canaries. And what's nice about this is because of how it sits within the organization, the tool has been able to grow a lot of small but very valuable and useful features so that as a whole, all those put together make for a very... Uh, valuable tool for us. Uh, so here's one example of, um, uh, from the system showing a dashboard of currently ongoing releases. And the point here is that this has got rich links, bridges to other tools. So it links to systems for uh, server management, for incident management, uh, for customer support. So all the teams that are constituents of those tools now have a bridge and a link back to understand what's going on with releases. Uh, and this also helps us uh, embody um, and, and carry on the best practices that we've learned over time. So we've learned if we want to be reliable, we have to do A-B comparisons for any change that we make. And this tool makes it dead simple for anybody that wants to do a change to get those kind of comparisons. So what, what has made this work well for us? Uh, two things. One, as I said, the, the, the maintaining team here sits at a natural hub within the structure of, our, of all of our teams. And two, uh, the project sits at natural confluence points within the dynamic communication flows of our organization. So the team responsible is present in things like um, change review meetings, or post-mortems, or design reviews. And those serve as very low friction ways to gather feature requirements to evolve the tool. So this has been a nice success story for us internally. 
Uh, it's a great tool um, that evangelizes our core technology values and the best practices that we have. Uh, we've had a nice culture that supports the continuing evolution of the tool. A uh, couple quick takeaways. Uh, tools need to have a clearly defined team responsible for maintaining them. Uh, when you're doing something new, you want to be strategic. Look with your, in your organization and find the sweet spots that will help nourish that new thing that you're building. And sometimes you want to make small adjustments to your existing organization to better support uh, your existing tools. So that's my time. Uh, thanks for listening, and here's where you can find more information if you like. Thank you.